Hey guys, welcome back. We are going to do a little dive today into the topic of effective stresses and seepage of groundwater and how that affects effective stresses. Um, effective stresses are the stresses that, that, as I've said in the past, are the most important and critical for geotechnical engineers to wrap their arms around and to understand. Because in essence, effective stresses are like what are shown in this figure, right? They are the stresses that are transmitted from particle to particle, representing the stresses that the soil particles essentially feel. Um, and you have to remember, when you have a material like soil, what gives soil all of its desirable properties, all of the things that that we rely upon soil to do is the fact that there's interparticle stress. Interparticle stress leads to interparticle friction and interparticle shear. All of that leads to strength of the soil. If there wasn't those interparticle stresses, then we wouldn't the soil wouldn't have any strength. And if it didn't have any strength, we wouldn't be able to use it for anything and to support any of our structures or our buildings. And so uh, this concept of, of stress in soil is really what makes soil useful to us. And the concept of effective stress is what makes the concept of stresses useful to us. So let's take a deep dive. I, as I've said, effective stress, it is the key principle to understanding soil behavior and soil mechanics. This uh, equation right here is what I always refer to as the golden equation developed by the father of soil mechanics, Carl Terzaghi. Effective stress is equal to the total stress minus the pore pressure. Uh, if you're wondering what total stress is, what pore pressure is, feel free to go back to the 341 lecture on uh, my YouTube channel that talks about and introduces the concept of effective stresses, I'm going to assume uh, that you have a basic knowledge or understanding of total stress and pore pressure, and we're just going to blaze on through. Uh, because I'm going to assume that you have a basic understanding, I'm going to also assume that in somewhere, sometime in a soil mechanics class, you were asked to solve for stress problems. So let's just do a crash course and, and a review on solving total stresses and effective stresses. So here we have a simple little tank filled with soil and filled with water. And I have at a given depth here, a little teeny cube of soil that is blown up right here. We have vertical stresses that we're going to call sigma one. And then we have two horizontal stresses. We have one on this axis that we're going to call sigma two, and one on this axis that we're going to call sigma three. And we're going to assume that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that this soil here is, uh, that sigma two and sigma three are equal to each other. Um, and they're going to equal the horizontal stresses that our little soil cube is feeling. We also have a piezometer that has been tapped into our little tank of soil. And you can see the height of the water in the piezometer. Note that the height of the water in the tank and in the piezometer is equal. That means that there is no flow from the piezometer into the soil, nor is there any flow from the soil into the piezometer. This, my friends, is the example of a static condition where uh, you, ha you have static groundwater, there is no groundwater flow. It's the easiest and most basic type of problem to solve. Okay, so let's just get to it. Say we want to solve for sigma one on our soil cube. So this is the vertical total stress on our sigma one. Well, we know that the vertical stress is going to equal first the vertical stress from the first layer of moist soil. So that's just going to be the unit weight of the moist soil times the thickness of the moist soil. And then we have the saturated unit weight of the saturated soil times the thickness 
of it on top of our cube of soil. Why do I use the saturated unit weight? Well, because the soil is saturated. So here we go. Throwing in some numbers, for the top layer, the moist unit weight is 115 pounds per cubic foot, and it's two feet thick. The saturated unit weight for the saturated soil is 125 pounds per cubic foot, and there is three feet of that down to our cube of soil. So if I perform the calculations, I come up with 605 pounds per square foot. So now if I want to compute the pore pressure uh, inside of that cube, all I need to do is take the unit weight of water and multiply it by, if you said H2, uh, thinking uh, from the top of the water down to that cube, um, I don't want to say you're wrong, but I want to say it anyway. You're wrong. And I don't mean that in a mean way. But I need you to start changing the way you think about how we calculate pore pressures, okay? That pore pressure U right there, that pore pressure represents the pore pressure from a piezometer that is installed at the depth of interest. So you have to start thinking of pore pressure in terms of the pressure from a piezometer. Well, why not just use the pressure from the water in the soil itself? Because that height of the water can be tricky and it can fool you. It can fool you because if there's seepage or flow of groundwater going on, then the pore pressure is changing uh, due to seepage. It's not just a constant static problem anymore. It, but if you have uh, a piezometer set up where you're just measuring the pressure at a given depth, the water inside the piezometer is static and it's not changing. And so think of a piezometer as a way to do a point measurement of pressure at anywhere within the soil. So that height that we use in calculating a pore pressure is the height of the water in our piezometer of interest. Okay? So from the height of the water in my piezometer, I see that there is three feet of height. Therefore, three feet times the unit weight of water gives me 187 pounds per square foot of pressure at the bottom of my piezometer. Now finally, we're going to make our calculation of effective stress, the effective vertical stress at my soil cube is equal to the total vertical stress minus the pore pressure and the pore water. So that's 605 minus 187 and I get 418 pounds per square foot. Okay, so that gave me my vertical effective stress. But what about the horizontal? Well, we learned in 341 that we can compute horizontal stresses by multiplying the vertical stress by a lateral earth pressure coefficient. We just have to get the right earth pressure coefficient. So you have to ask yourself, okay, is my soil um, at rest? Is my soil under active conditions or is my soil under passive conditions? To, if, if that phrase confuses you, then uh, please go back and watch my 341 lesson on lateral earth pressures part one. And that goes into depth on explaining the difference between passive and active earth pressures, okay? In this particular case where everything is just sitting, nothing is moving relative to anything else, uh, all we have are just static pressures. Uh, if that's the case, then we are going to do the at rest lateral earth pressures. And we're going to use a K naught, which is the at rest lateral earth pressure coefficient. So how do we calculate K naught? Uh, we're going to use this relationship right here, a very common equation used in geotechnical engineering. 
And all it is is a function of the soil friction angle, which is given to us right here, 34 degrees. So if I plug that into our my equation for at rest lateral earth pressure coefficient, I compute a value of 0.44. So if I throw 0.44 in with my vertical effective stress, I get 184 pounds per square foot for sigma 2 and sigma 3. Let's get down though to the nitty gritty of what effective stress really is. Now, it, it takes a little bit of conceptualization to understand effective stress. So um, I've given this a lot of thought and others have as well. And this is the way that I like to think of it. Um, and, and part of my quirkiness here, but I find that a little bit of quirkiness helps students remember certain concepts. So um, I'm going to say, uh, Imagine that I am a superhero and that I am an X-Man and my mutant superpower is that I'm elastic and I can stretch my body or my hands in any elastic shape, form or otherwise that I want. Okay, so let's imagine that I have my tank of uh, soil again and it's filled with soil and water and I have my piezometer attached at this depth where the piezometer is located. You can imagine that I just have a whole bunch of soil grains that are in contact one with another. Some are higher than others, some are lower than others, some are larger than others, some are smaller than others. But if I were to isolate all of the soil particles uh, that are about at that depth in my tank, uh, at that level in the tank, what those soil particles are transmitting all of this weight that's above it, okay? They're being transmitted through all of these little particle-to-particle-to-particle -to -particle -to -particle contacts. Okay, so imagine that I use my mutant power to take my hand and start to weasel and work my flat rubber hand all the way from particle to particle contact. I don't go through the particles. No, nope, that's against the rules. And I'm not coming down and up and doing this kind of thing. I'm trying to keep it as straight of a line as possible. Passing, so that plane, my hand is passing through the particle to particle contacts. Okay. Now once I do that, imagine then that I can take my hand and flip it up and look at it uh, on its side. And if I were to do that, it might look something like this, okay? Well, here's this plane now. Represents the area of my hand that was inside the tank. Now there's two parts to this. I have the part of my hand that was passing from the particle, uh, right between the particles, where my hand was getting pinched by those particles, that represents these little black dots. And they would be a dot because the particle to particle contact is very, very, very small. Just a little point load. Okay? Now, All of this other area represents void space. Void space where water is located. So in these spaces right here, the material that is touching my hand is water. It's a fluid. Okay, you get the idea. And then if I take the summation of the area touching water and the area in between the particle to particle contacts, all of that is going to equal my total area. So the particle to particle contact we're going to call A sub S for 
the area of soil contacts. And then the uh, all the area that's blue is the area of my hand that's in contact with water, and we're going to call that A sub W. So A sub W plus A W is going to equal A. That's my relationship here, okay? So on this wavy plane, that's my X-Man freaky hand, I want you to consider all the vertical forces that my hand is feeling. Let's, let's spell them out. First of all, we have those particle-to-particle -particle contact forces. I'm going to label these as F sub S, S for soil particles, soil contacts. So these, these forces transmit all of the forces of the weight of all the soil above it. So it can be a very large force. And remember that it, it's acting on a very, very small area. All those forces are concentrated on those little teeny points where the particles are touching one another. So <clears throat> because the area of those surface contacts are very, very small, and the forces being transmitted can be very, very large. If I take a large force divided by a very, very small area, I get a massive or enormous pressure. So these particle-to-particle -particle contact forces can result in very, very large pressures between the soil grains. Okay, next is the buoyancy forces from the pore water. So all that water that's in that void space between the particle-to-particle -particle contacts, that pore water is has some buoyant effect to it, and it's trying to lift up my hand. So we're going to call those buoyancy forces F sub W, for W meaning water. So these come directly from the pore water pressures in the pore space. And F sub W is just simply equal to the pore pressure in the pore space times the area on which that pore pressure is occurring. So, but we also know already that the area that that water is pressing on is equal to the total area minus the area of the solid. So we're going to hang on to that relationship for a little bit and we'll come back to it in a minute. There's two other forces that are in play when we start talking about soil particles. One uh, is attractive forces. So attractive forces are all of the forces that are trying to pull the soil particles closer together. So this could be cementation from chemical bonding, or it could be even electromagnetic forces, uh, molecular forces like van der Waal forces. Uh, so anything that pulls the particles closer together are attractive forces. And then you have repulsive forces, F sub R. Repulsive forces are molecular forces that are trying to push the soil particles apart. So these are usually electrostatic forces due to the double layers of our soil particles or whatnot. And um, they're trying to repel soil particles. Now, if we drew a free body diagram of one of our soil particles, it would have some equivalent force that it was feeling, and that force would have to be the summation of the particle-to-particle -particle forces, the water buoyancy forces, the repulsive forces, and also the attraction forces. But notice that the attraction forces are going the other way. They're, they're attracting, they're pulling the particle in instead of pushing on it. And all of those forces have to sum to equal zero in a static system. So let's go ahead and create a governing equation here. We know that the total forces are going to equal the summation of the particle-to-particle uh, the -particle forces, the water buoyancy forces, the repulsive forces, minus the attraction forces. Now let's say I didn't want to deal with forces, but I wanted to deal with stresses. So if I divide 
both sides of this equation by the total area of my freaky X-Man hand, I would end up with something like this. Now, total, that total force that's act that my soil particle is feeling, that all the weight of everything, divided by the area of, my, of the container, the area of my wavy hand, that's going to equal what we call total stress, okay? It's just the sum of all of the forces that the soil particle might feel divided by the total area of the soil layer. Okay, but now you can see how we could divide up um, each of these forces uh, by a and get little individual stresses from each of those. If I focus on this guy right here that I'm circling, this is equal to the interparticle forces divided by the cross-sectional area of my container or the, the area of my wavy hand. And that stress is what we're going to call sigma sub ig or the intergranular stress. So let's substitute IG in for that guy right there. And now we have uh, sigma sub IG. And we're going to sub in the relationship we derived previously for force of water. Force of water is the pore pressure times the area of the water, or the total area minus the area of the, of the uh, particle to particle contacts. And then this repulsive force divided by the area, we'll just call this the repulsive stress and write it as a big R prime. And similar thing we'll do for the A, for the attractive forces. So that's the attractive stress. Okay. So now uh, that's my new equation for total stress. And then I can do a little bit of algebra, divide that A into that and to and divide the, the total area into the area of the solids and I come up with this relationship right here. Okay, so that's just a little algebra for us to simplify things. Here's what we know. Compared to the total area of my hand, those areas of the point-to-point -point contacts were like teeny infinitesimal little dots, little points. So those little, the summation of all those little points is still next to nothing compared to the total area of my hand. So this ratio of, of the area of the point-to-point -point contacts divided by the total area of my wavy hand, that ratio is approximately equal to zero. And we usually know that the repulsive and the attractive stresses are usually pretty small. The one exception is when we're dealing with high plasticity clays, which we will talk about in uh, just one moment. So if I make this assumption and I make that ratio go to zero, and I go ahead and assume that that's approximately equal to zero, my relationship for total stress simplifies dramatically. And I end up with this equation right there. And if I just reorganize it and solve for my intergranular stress, then that's simply equal to total stress minus the pore water pressure uh, in the soil. Hence, intergranular stress is equal to effective stress. So what about highly plastic clays? What do we do with those? Well, you'll recall that a clay has two types. You either have a dispersive clay or you have a flocculated clay. In a dispersive clay, all of the clay molecules are separated by double layers and no clay particle is actually touching one another. And so 
if no clay particles are touching one another, it's impossible to have intergranular stresses. If that's the case, then the intergranular stresses or the effective stress of the, the dispersive clay is equal to zero. Well, if that's equal to zero, then my word, uh, the, the effective stress has to be coming from something because it, you know, even, even dispersive clay can hold buildings up and stuff like that. So what is it that's holding all of that weight? Simple. It's got to be the repulsive and the attractive forces. So that means if my intergranular force is zero, that means that my repulsive minus the attractive forces have to be greater than zero. So if I were to write that equation down then, it would look something like this for a dispersive system. I'd have no intergranular stress, but all of my effective stress would be coming from the repulsive minus the attractive forces. Now what about a completely flocculated system? In this instance, I do have uh, particles that are touching one another. Clay particles are, are bonding to each other, and so it, it looks like a jumbled house of cards. If clay particles are in contact with each other, that means that we can have intergranular stresses. So those stresses will be something greater than zero. And if the particles are touching one another, that means that my attractive forces were larger than my repulsive forces because it was the attractive forces that brought those particles together. So if attractive forces or, or attractive stresses, excuse me, are larger than repulsive stresses, that means that R minus A has to be less than zero because the attractive stresses are greater than the repulsive stresses. So if that's the case, then we know that, uh, whoops, sorry, then we know that um, this value right here is going to be negative. If that value is negative for R minus A, well then that means that the intergranular stress between my flocculated particles has to be greater than the effective stress. So, for a dispersive system, here's something that you need to take away and remember. All of the stresses, all of the stresses held by the clay particles are being transferred and held by the interaction of the double layer. They're, they're literally, all of that weight and everything that's on that clay layer and that it's holding up is being supported by essentially repulsion of double layers. There is no particle-to-particle -particle contact. Now, uh, some students, they get confused and they wonder, oh, man, I still don't understand effective stress. How does effective stress work again? I always like to show this example right here, and we're going to walk through this, this calculation together, but it demonstrates the idea of effective stress. And I remember effective stress is the uh, is essentially the stress that the particles feel from one another. So, let's say we have two scenarios. We will have a shallow pond. It's more like a swamp, I guess, because we only have one foot of water. And we're going to go beneath the ground surface only by one foot, and that's where point A is located. Uh, in our second scenario, we have deep ocean where we're beneath 500 feet of water. But beneath that 500 feet, we have one foot of ground that we're going into that we're going to compute stresses for. So let's go ahead and just make an assumption to make things simple that we're going to have just 100 pounds per cubic foot is the unit weight for both of these soils, okay? And the reason we're doing that is just to keep it, the calculation simple. Okay, and by the way, would these be moist or saturated? 
Yeah, if you said saturated, you're right. Because we're beneath the water table. Okay, so here goes. For point A, effective stress at point A is going to equal the buoyant stress at point A times the depth to point A. And that's going to equal the saturated unit weight minus the unit weight of water times the depth to point A. So that's just going to be 100 pounds per cubic foot minus 62.4 pounds per cubic foot times one foot into the clay layer. And that's going to give me uh, 38.6 pounds per square foot. So that's my effective stress at point A. Okay, let's do the same calculation, but this time for point B. So for point B, again, it's going to be the buoyant unit weight for at point B times the depth below the soil surface to point B, which is going to equal the saturated unit weight for point B minus the unit weight of water times the depth below the clay sur uh, surface down to point B. That is uh, simply going to equal saturated unit weight. Here we go. 100 pounds per cubic foot minus 62.4 times the depth beneath the surface of the clay, one foot. And I get the same answer. Wow, okay. Well, now some of you may go, hold on, buoyant unit you know, weight, where did the world of that come from? Uh, what happened to total stress minus pore pressure? Okay, okay, smarty pants. We'll play your game. Um, there's different ways to skin a cat. What I showed you is my preferred way to calculate effective stresses, but we'll do it your way too. That's going to equal total stress at A minus pore pressure at A. So total stress at A is going to equal the weight of the water times the depth of the water times the depth of the water plus the saturated unit weight times the depth of that saturated soil down to point A. So that's 62.4 times one foot plus 100 pounds per cubic foot times one foot. That, by the way, I should say, is my total stress, okay? That's my total stress. What about pore pressure? Well, pore pressure is just going to be the, uh, if I were to put a piezometer in at point A, how high would the piezometer rise up? How high would that piezometer rise? Well, if you said to the top of the lake, you're right. You are correct. So that means the depth of the water in my piezometer, it's, it's the unit weight of water times the depth of the water in my piezometer.
Okay. So let's calculate that. That's 62.4 times two feet. That's how much, that's the depth of the water in my piezometer. Okay, well, if we calculate this out, then what we have is 100 pounds per square foot. 62 da, 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 minus 62.4 pounds per square foot is going to give us 38.6 pounds per square foot. Whoa, same thing we got before just a lot more calculations you can see why i like to do it my way instead what's the moral of all this what i'm trying to tell you folks is it doesn't matter how much surface water is above the our soil all that matters when we're talking about particle to particle stresses that are being transmitted is the amount of the soil that is being trans the amount of the weight of the soil is the weight of the overlying soil that's being transmitted that's all that matters and in this instance both are only one foot beneath the ground surface so both have the same effective stress okay if you have questions on that come talk to me um, and we can walk through it Oh, you can't even see that, can you? There you go. The effective stress in both cases, folks, is the same. Okay, let's deal with seepage. How do we understand how seepage affects effective stress? The thing to remember with seepage is if, if the water is seeping, then your pore pressure is not just going to be unit weight of water times depth of water. You're also going to have some seepage forces in there as well that you have to account for. And so like, nothing's changed, folks. The easiest way to compute pore pressures at a given depth, like say at point B, is to assume that there is a piezometer drilled into our tube or into our soil at that depth and to measure the amount of water that rises up into that piezometer. So in this instance at, at point B, it's going to be whatever this depth is, I mean we'll call that just Z, and pore pressure at B is going to equal Z times the unit weight of water. It's just that simple. Um, what about at point C? What's pore pressure equal to? Well, it's just again the depth of the water in the piezometer corresponding to point C times the unit weight of water. That's how you compute pore pressure at point C. What about at point A? Same thing. The depth of the water in a piezometer installed at point A times the unit weight of water. That's how we get pore pressure. So you guys know how to compute total stresses pretty easily. It's just the, the unit weight of whatever we're talking about times the depth of that material. So if the unit weight here is just the unit weight of water, then you can see that at the bottom of the water, my total stress is the depth of the water, H1, times the unit weight of water. Now once we get down into the soil, we have a different unit weight, the saturated unit weight of the soil. So you can see that the slope of my total stress line changes with depth, and it's equal to then um, H1 times uh, oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm mistaken. This isn't just water up here. There's soil up there as well. It's just a different type of soil that happens to be blue colored. That's kind of funny. Okay, that's why it says gamma M, I think. Okay. No, wait, that's a W. Uh, I hate blurry graphics. Okay, that's gamma W. So it is just water. Never mind. Okay, so there's the stress from the water plus 
the stress from the soil. So Z, the depth into the soil, whatever our depth is, times the saturated unit weight. All the way down until we get to the bottom right here, where that's just going to be the total stress from the water on top, plus the total stress of the soil beneath. Okay, that's total stress. Pore pressure, we're just computing pore pressure in three points, at point A, at point C, and at point B. Why those three points? Well, because we had three piezometers. So we're going to compute pore pressure wherever we can um, reasonably estimate or know what a piezometer level is going to be. So once I have my plot of total stress and my plot of pore pressure, I just have to subtract the pore pressure from the total stress. And if I do that, I end up with a plot of effective stress. Okay. Now, in this equation, you see this term I. Remember, I is equal to the hydraulic gradient. And the hydraulic gradient is just a measure of the uh, how efficiently or how rapidly a soil is burning energy and water as water is flowing through it. So the um, the higher the hydraulic gradient, the more energy it will require water to work its way through that soil. So remember, hydraulic gradient is just the change in head divided by the length of seepage flow, or the length of the, the seepage path that the water had to take to lose that head. Case in point. Let's say I have a datum right here. The amount of head at point B is equal to the height of the water in a piezometer. Okay, so we're just going to call that um, H of B. And if I measure the height of the water at point A, relative to that same datum, then that's just going to be H of A. So you can see that they're not the same height. And water is flowing up through the soil. So it started at point B with higher energy or higher head, and by the time it reached point A, it had lost some head. How much head? Well, it's lost HB minus HA, which we're just going to call H. So that's the head loss from my seepage. Okay, how, how uh, or what was the length of soil that the water had to flow through in order for that seepage to occur? Well, from point B to point A, which is equal to a distance of H2. So my hydraulic gradient for this problem is equal to the head loss of H divided by the length of the seepage path H2. So if I have water or fluid that is seeping upwards through the soil and it's seeping in a direction opposite the direction of gravity, what's going to happen is my soil particles are going to feel less interparticle stress because the seepage forces are helping lift up those soil particles. It's, it's kind of like blowing them up or something. Um, if, that's, if, if that's happening, if I have upward seepage or seepage going against the force of gravity, I'm going to have a decreased effective stress. But what if things were different? What if I took um, this piezometer at uh, point B right here and I changed the amount of water that was in it? What if I lowered that water down so that at point B the water was only at this level? 
okay so that's going to look something like this if I uh, if I change that water level uh, in the piezometer at point B so that it's lower than the piezometer level at point A remember that fluid always flows from a high head to low head I used to have high head at B and lower head at A so my water would flow upwards in the soil but now that's changed now my head if I, if I take a datum and I measure the distance from this datum to the water the top of the water in each of my piezometers you can see that the distance from my datum to the water at point A that that uh, that distance is greater than the distance from my datum to the top of the water in the piezometer at point B in my soil that means that the water at point A has more energy than the water at point B so if fluid is going to flow from high energy to low energy that means then that the flow is going to reverse and now we're going to have uh, fluid flowing from top down through the soil and we're going to have downward seepage okay nothing's changed in terms of my calculations I still calculate total stress and pore pressure the same pore pressure is calculated uh, by calculating the height of the water in the piezometer at each of these depths but it's going to change the values on my pore pressure plot such that if I were then to subtract the pore pressure from the total stress I get a different effective stress profile if I'm using my shortcut method that uses buoyant unit weight and hydraulic gradient the difference here is if I have downward stress I'm adding my seepage component to stress if I go backwards one slide to my upward seepage notice I'm subtracting the seepage component which decreases effective stress so the moral of the story if I have downward seepage think of that as that water is seeping down in the direction of gravity it's helping gravity assisting gravity so it's going to push those soil particles together more by pushing those particles together more it adds to the intergranular stresses that they're already feeling and we're going to increase effective stress so upward seepage we have a decrease in effective stress downward seepage we have an increase in effective stress okay so if I have upward seepage and it decreases effective stress is it possible to have enough decrease in stress that my effective stress or my intergranular particle to particle stress goes to zero yeah it's possible so let's start with our effective stress equation okay and let's go ahead and um, let's compute what we would need or, or what the hydraulic gradient would need to be in order to have an effective stress that would be equal to zero or in other words if the pore pressure equals the total stress if the pore pressure equals the total stress then our effective stress will equal zero so let's plug in the math here's my equation for um, total stress here's my equation for pore pressure and those are from the, the plots on the previous page okay so if I do the math and I come up with it here's that equation there's the minus the subtraction sign that we talked about and remember buoyant unit weight equals saturated unit weight minus the unit weight of water Okay, that's the buoyant unit weight 
Now if we take this equation and we set it equal to zero, that's what we're doing right here, let's calculate what that gradient needs to be to make that true. So we set that equation equal to zero and we solve for hydraulic gradient. Here's what we get. Okay, well, we can simplify that by canceling out the z's, and then we just end up with this simple relationship right here. Buoyant unit weight divided by the unit weight of water. Uh, we can simplify it or write it a different way. The it's, uh, buoyant unit weight is just the saturated unit weight minus the unit weight of water, all divided by the unit weight of water. So if we were to take typical values that are found in typical soil, and plug those in and see what the ranges would be of um, critical gradients. By the way, we call this we call this uh, the critical gradient. The critical gradient is the gradient of the soil that makes the effective stress go to zero. If I were to calculate the critical gradient for a wide range of soils, I would see that the critical ge gradient generally falls between about 0 0.8 to 1.1. So it's right around a value of 1. What that means, realistically, is if the gradient in my soil ever gets close to 0 0.8 to 1.1, that seepage is going to be sufficient to pull my soil particles apart and put them into suspension. Once the soil particles are in suspension, there is no more particle-to-particle -particle contact. The particles are individual, they're independent, and they're just floating in this fluid. There's no more shear strength. There's no more large compressive stress or, or large compressive strength. Uh, it, it effectively is now a fluid. And that's a bad, scary place to be. If, if you have zero effective stress, you also have zero confinement, which means then that that fluid, that, that flowing, seeping groundwater, is now free to erode and carry away the soil. And that, friends, is how dams fail and levees fail. Um, so this kind of phenomenon can kill people. To prevent that from happening, there's regulations that are out there that, that prevent engineers from even getting close to critical gradient. For example, in the work that I did as a consultant with uh, projects with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who oversees lots of the um, flood control levees throughout the country and also several of the dams located throughout the country. The Corps of Engineers has a maximum allowable gradient of 0.5 or so. They will not allow any of the soils in their levees or dams to have a hydraulic gradient um, larger than 0.5. And they're doing this to keep you away from piping or to keep you away from that zero effective stress condition so that uh, those hydraulic structures, those dams, those levees can do their job. Okay, well, we're going to do some um, fun physical demonstrations in class to show you a little bit about seepage and a little bit about effective stress. We'll do that when I get back in town on Friday, I think. Um, so take notes of what questions you have and uh, feel free to get a head start on the homework, guys. Um, and you can ask me your questions in class on Friday, or you can come find me during my office hours. Uh, anyway, I appreciate your attention watching this lecture, and uh, can't wait to catch you next time. Thanks.